Welcome back once again. So we'll continue again from the slide where we stopped last week. Uh, we remember we were discussing uh, the gap junctions in general. We'll not be able to finish it completely also today. Uh, so in general, remember the gap junctions uh, were set up between two neighbor cells. These neighbor uh, cells both opened gap junctions that were aligned together uh, so that uh, messenger molecules can flow from one uh, cell to the other successfully. And with the flow of these uh, messenger molecules, we are able to create a signal which can carry information, which is our aim in communications. So continuing from there, when a cell is triggered by one of these messenger molecules, the endoplasmic reticulum and also the mitochondria serve as uh, calcium pools, storages where you have many calcium ions. And these calcium ions, are, uh, sorry, these uh, calcium pools are triggered to release these calcium ions into the cytoplasm so that the cytoplasmic uh, calcium ion concentration suddenly significantly increases. This way, you start the signal actually. But after some time, uh, these ions will finally return back to their calcium pools and be stored once again. Thus, the uh, calcium ion uh, concentration in the cytoplasm will uh, decrease again. So the cell will return to its former ion concentration state. And among the uh, two different calcium ion, uh, sorry, calcium signal, uh, signaling uh, secondary messengers, IP3 is an important one uh, that's used for uh, triggering this operation using what we call the internal pathway between the cells, whereas the other uh, messenger molecule will be uh, done through ATP, which is transmitted now. Uh, not uh, through the uh, gaps, uh, gap junctions between the cells, but through uh, other mechanisms uh, between the cells, the ATP will be released to the environment, and that ATP hopefully will be received by nearby cells, which will trigger a similar external pathway in those neighbor cells, and this way the uh, signal will be propagated to the neighbor cells, but this time possibly also skipping some cells in between. Because the released ATP may skip the ne nearby cell and go to another neighbor. The internal pathway method, which is triggered by IP3, uh, is used uh, when a cell is stimulated, and with the stimulation of the cell, the IP3 uh, molecules in, uh, will be released, and this will trigger that release of the calcium ions from uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Then these secondary uh, messenger molecules will leak through these gap junctions to the neighbor cells, but that gap, uh, there should be, of course, already established gap junctions between these two neighbor cells, rule one, and the second requirement is that that gap junction should be open for the passage of these messenger molecules. Uh, this way, they will be triggering the release of calcium ions now in the neighbor cell. This way, we will have a wave that is propagating from one cell to the other. Okay? Thus, it's called intracellular calcium waves, in short, ICW. Uh, when passing between these cells, as we mentioned, these IP3 molecules pass through what we call the gap junctions. And it has been tested in lab environment that the uh, intercellular calcium waves can travel at speeds between 15 to 23 micrometers per second. Roughly one or two cell sizes. Okay? And the waves can spread to 100 to 400 cells. Once you start the calcium wave, it can travel 100 to 400 cells, depending on the cell type, of course. On the other hand, in the external pathway method, 
after the first cell is stimulated, the stimulation of the first cell typically requires some other mechanism. But once the first cell has been stimulated, the uh, trigger of the calcium ion release in the following cells is uh, triggered this time by the release of ATP. But this time ATP is not going through the uh, gap junctions, but the ATP will be released by the triggered cell into the uh, inter uh, intercellular environment and it will diffuse with Brownian motion with higher probability of arriving at nearby cells. But typically it's also possible that this ATP could uh, flow to further distances to other cells. With the uh, arrival at the other cells, this time it will start a similar operation in that other cell. This type of communication between the cells is called the external pathway because it occurs outside the cell as opposed to the intercellular, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, internal pathway which is uh, inside the cell. These molecules, uh, as we said, will be uh, diffusing in the environment and at the receiving side you need a receptor that will accept ATP. Remember that there's a different receptor for each uh, chemical substance. So you will need ATP receptors, typically, for example, the P2 receptors in the cell membrane of the nearby cells. These receptors trigger the ion concentration uh, in that uh, nearby cell then. The cells within the multicellular organisms like human beings and animals and plants uh, form a complex network of communicating agents. The intracellular and intercellular mechanisms for communication should work hand in hand. It's not like use either this one or that one. It's not an exclusive or you actually need all of them. And this has to be done in a very coordinated manner uh, so that the message can be correctly transmitted and also received at the uh, other end so that we can pass the information from one cell to the other so that the cells of the multicellular organism can work in coordination. Uh, so the multicellular organisms now will need a very complex intercellular mechanism and it took about 2.5 billion years in evolution to achieve this. So the time from the unicellular organisms to the multicellular organisms is about 2.5 billion years in evolution. And this time delay in this evolution is actually uh, indicating how complex actually this communication system is, how long it took for such a system to come into place. Cell signaling typically has evolved primarily in the form of signaling molecules. So that means you're transmitting your information by making use of the molecules, encoding your information on some feature of the molecule waves, some of which may convey information over longer distances, uh, for example, through an organism, uh, and others that only impact the adjacent cells. Okay. What we have discussed up to now was mostly communication between adjacent cells, but there are uh, other mechanisms as we will discuss. Cells typically emit signals in, by making use of the molecules, as we said, that are received at the destination by the corresponding receptor proteins. And these receptor proteins are typically on the surface of the cell in order to stay easily bound to the signal molecule. So for the sake of simplicity, consider a cell as a spherical object. You will have many receptors on the surface. There's something called the affinity range uh, by which a nearby molecule is attracted towards the receptor so, uh, so that a molecule when it is close, very close to the uh, receptor it will uh, directly go towards the receptor 
However, this affinity range is typically very small. This affinity range is actually providing that the molecule is properly aligned so that it can attach to the uh, receptor. But then that means if you consider that spherical cell, it should be almost covered uh, with uh, receptors all over. Okay? So there should be thousands of receptors all over the cell. And as the cell gets larger, of course, the number of receptors on the cell membrane should increase. Luckily, it has been shown that uh, without putting so many receptors, actually, you can receive most, not all, but most of the uh, molecules that come close by to the cell. Like covering one in five thousandths of that surface. Receptor proteins are, uh, sorry, we already talked about that. And the binding of the signaling molecule to these receptor uh, molecules will typically activate an intracellular signaling pathway. So you don't, there are receptors that take the molecule in, but there are also cases where the messenger molecule just uh, reaches at the receptor and binds with the receptor. This binding operation then will trigger some other chemical reactions in the inner side of the membrane. And these chemical reactions actually will start whatever you wish. Okay? So that's called that intracellular signaling pathway starting from typically the cell membrane to the inner uh, organelles of the cell, which interpret the signal causing the signal as uh, causing the cell to generate the appropriate response, whatever that response is. In order to, so uh, this figure actually slightly explains this. If we look at the figure, this side of the structure is the inner side of the cell, and this side is outside the cell. It's called the extracellular environment. So this is actually your membrane. Okay? On the cell membrane, you, uh, which is a, a lipid bilayer, you have such structures that allow the passage of the molecules. Okay? So uh, it is composed of uh, several uh, steps like recognition, with the recognition, the incoming molecule, for example, here, is taken in, and then uh, you do translocation and then release it to the uh, cytoplasm inside the cell, and then recover this gate. Okay? So in order to use cell signaling by ions, where the ion is here now, the cells continuously need to pump the ions in or out of the cell. You can use the ion pumps in both directions. Typically, you use the uh, ion pumps to force the passage of these ions in the direction reverse to the concentration gradient. That means the following. Well, if, for example, uh, the sodium ion concentration outside the cell is higher compared to what you have inside, for example, in the case of neurons, uh, in that case, you don't need to use a pump. If you just open the uh, gaps with diffusion, they will go from high concentration to low concentration. That's a rule of diffusion. However, if you want to send the ions inside the cell to outside, then you should use the pumps. Okay? And the pumps will throw the uh, ions in the other direction against uh, the concentration gradient. Okay? But of course, to do this, the pump now has to spend energy. 
which means it will consume some ATP, it will take some ATP, and by making use of that ATP, it will be able to pump it out, which is explained here. Or another way of uh, having that energy is, of course, through photons, depending on the cell type. A transporter pump uh, that goes through four stages, as we discussed. First, the recognition. Recognize that ion. It will pass only that type of ion, not the others. Uh, then translocation, taking it in, then releasing it in the other side, and finally recovering to its original position. One third of the energy of a resting uh, mammal is typically spent for spent by these uh, ion pumps or these transport pump operations. Just think of it. As you're actually in your daily life, one third of what you're eating, the source of your energy, is actually just spent for this operation. Think about the, all other operations, they take the remaining two thirds. There are four types of transporter pumps. One is a uniport uh, in which only one molecule moves in one direction. In the simport, two molecules simultaneously go in one direction. In the case of antiport, sequentially, you pass the ions in opposite directions, one out and the other in. And there's also the electrogenic uh, pumps that uh, charge uh, molecules in one direction only. This is, for example, used by, uh, for example, the uh, electrogenic eels in the sea. That's uh, how, for example, eels and also uh, some types of catfish produce uh, the electric power, okay? These transported devices might also be used for forming different uh, nanomachines, let me say. So there are many nanomechanical transported devices proposed by uh, Drexler. For example, the sorting rotors uh, selectively bind to molecules in a solution and move them against, again, the concentration gradient. Every time when we say against concentration gradient, that means you have to spend energy, okay? So, for example, here you have blood plasma, and here you have your rotor turning, in this case, it's uh, turning clockwise. So, uh, the molecules you want to transport from the uh, blood plasma to this side are now selected here and they will be bound here and as this one is turning when it comes here it will be unbound and released to this side okay so this way it will selectively carry these black molecules whatever they are depending on what type of a receiver you have here they will be transported to this side but note that it may also sometimes make some errors possible okay and the scale we have here is from here to here is 20 nanometers. Okay, so we're really talking about nano devices. You can have a cascade of these uh, rotors, this time to do purification. Remember, in the previous figure here, we had an erroneous molecule carried to the right side. To get rid of them, what you can do is, you can put here the rotor we just discussed, and put here another rotor, this time which takes not the black molecules, but the white molecules, and take them out. So if some white molecules, by mistake, pass through this rotor, hopefully they will diffuse and be caught by this one and taken out. If not, if they can still go in here, these will take care of it, okay? And depending on the purification level you want, you can have more or less cascades of these molecules. Hopefully, there will be almost no white molecules left on the side. You can make use of molecular mills, which is actually a very similar idea. 
but this time to transport the molecules for longer distances. This is working like a conveyor belt, actually. So again, as we did previously, there's a rotor here that's selectively picking those black molecules. And as it is turning, at this point, it is releasing this molecule. Of course, you should have a mechanism here that binds to these black molecules stronger than this rotor does. Okay? And this time, they will be carried over this conveyor belt all the way to this side. And here they will be again picked and thrown on the side. Okay? So in order for these mechanisms to work properly, the molecules need to be able to bind to the receptors on the surface of the cells. But of course, you should always have a, a mechanism for releasing it. Once it gets uh, bound to the uh, rotor, it shouldn't stay there. Otherwise, the rotor will not be able to pick any other molecules. It will be soon full. Affinity is thus the measure of the tightness that a molecule, such a molecule, sticks on the uh, rotor or the receptor. So it is defined by the ratio of the binding rate over the dissociation rate, releasing rate. The affinity is influenced by covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and van der Waals forces. And two types of molecules can be bound to the receptors. They're called the agonists and the antagonists. The agonists typically bind to the receptors and cause some conformational change in the receptor molecule, which will further trigger other mechanisms behind, as we discussed. Okay, like in the cell membrane. In the case of antagonists, this is different. This time, uh, uh, they do not affect the cell, but what happens is these things will bind at the receptor and stay on the receptor so that the uh, agonist cannot bind to the receptor. This is actually a way of preventing, or in better terms, inhibiting the reception of specific molecules. This can be used for uh, good reasons, for uh, typically, for example, in uh, the living organisms, or also, uh, for example, for poisoning uh, a living organism. That's also possible. Okay, like for example, if you can prevent the reception of oxygen, then that would have a killing effect. So. Uh, these uh, agonists could also be uh, defined as full or partial agonists. In the case of full agonists, they can induce a conformational change in the receptor. So here, this orange shape is serving as the receptor, and the uh, agonist is the red here. Uh, when the red agonist uh, binds with the receptor, it will cause a conformational change in the receptor, which will trigger further operation. So it will provide the ability to induce changes in the receptor conformation, leading to activation. And this would be typically a measure of the intrinsic activity. Whereas in the case of partial agonist, it can induce some degree of receptor activation, but not sufficient for maximal response. Okay? In the case of antagonists, this time the antagonist will attach to the receptor so that uh, the uh, agonist cannot uh, bind with the receptor. Cell signaling, as we discussed earlier, is a part of a very complex system of communication between uh, multiple cells that controls fundamental cellular activities and coordination of cell behavior also. So the ability of the cells to perceive and correctly respond to an incoming message, uh, which causes a change in, uh, inside the cell, is the base of organ and organism development. 
tissue repair and also defense systems of the living uh, organisms. And any errors in such communication will have some very adverse effects uh, on the uh, living organisms. So errors in cellular information processing and communication causes many diseases such as cancer, autoimmunity and diabetes. And actually, most drugs work e uh, either uh, providing, uh, either as working as, for example, antagonist, so that some molecules cannot attach to the receptors, or prevent such things. Okay. Early signs of intercellular communication, if you look at the uh, evolution, uh, typically originated among single-celled organisms such as bacteria and yeast. And as we said, in about 2.5 billion years came the multicellular organisms. However, uh, even single-cellular organisms, they may have single cells individually, but they may be working together as a colony. Okay, so you might have a colony of single-celled organisms. And these typically work together. This is like the human colonies. Okay? If you're alone, you're weak. If you're in a group, you're stronger. So these single-cellular uh, organisms even have some communication. So they have some intercellular communication. That's not within the organism itself, but between the organisms. And that could be for many different purposes, uh, such as movement, antibiotic uh, biotic, uh, production, spore formation, and also something very important would be rate of reproduction. Like uh, when you have several of these uh, single cellular organisms, they will try, and if you have uh, sufficient food in the environment, they will reproduce, they will increase in number, increase, 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 and then they know where to stop reproduction. They don't grow any, uh, they don't reproduce any further, because if they do, there will be so many of those bacteria in the environment, so they will starve. So they know when to stop. And how do they do that? Actually, by doing communication uh, among each other. And that is typically by the molecules that are released. They sense the molecules released by the other single cellular organisms of the same type. And if the concentration of those molecules exceeds some threshold, they understand that now there are many of them. Of course, these organisms do not have their eyes, but by sensing these uh, molecules, they understand that there are many neighboring organisms of the same uh, type, and that would be too much of those organisms, so they will not reproduce any further. Okay? This is actually called quorum sensing. They do sensing together. Independent, but actually correlating in collaboration. Okay, so they emit molecules that indicate their presence, for example, and the concentration of these molecules increases as you have more of them present, which shows the density of the population of the cells. So, using current sensing, they, these independent living organisms coordinate in, group, uh, in groups to show some group behavior among, uh, among these single-celled organisms. So you should consider the complexity of information that should be done by such simple organisms. Okay. Typically, we try to do these as humans, and partly we're successful in that. We, for example, we have voting mechanisms, as you had yesterday in the United States. But as you can see, we have very complex mechanisms to achieve this. 
And these guys are doing this as uh, single-celled organisms. There are also many other forms of cellular and nanoscale signaling among uh, biological organisms, like the neural communications, endocrine systems, endocrine communication, and pheromone signals. All these can be used to communicate, but this time we're talking, these three uh, systems are longer distances compared to what we discussed in diffusion and gap junctions. Okay. They're still making use of such methods, like diffusion always is a, a significant uh, part of uh, such communications, but this time we're looking at longer distances. Like the neural systems use, of course, the neurons. That's where the name comes from. Uh, what's the size of a cell? Ten uh, we said in our simulations, we are typically taking it as 10 micrometers. That's because a typical cell size. The sizes of the cells, of course, and the shapes of the cells vary. Depends on the type. But, okay, that's a typical size. How about the others? Can be in meters, neurons. neurons can be in meters. Around one meter for a human being. And even longer, as we discussed earlier, for a giraffe, it's about two meters, for example. Okay? But of course, when I say one meter uh, cell in the human body, I don't mean a cell like this. It's, a, it's still actually a very small neuron, but it has very long, for example, dendrites. So altogether, end to end, it's around one meter. Okay? But this enables the cell to communicate at longer distances. Because from this end of the cell to the other end, it's a closed environment. So it would be using intracellular uh, communication for about a meter, and then switch to intercellular communication. The endocrine system is used in the human uh, or in the uh, living organisms where what carries the endocrine hormones. okay the hormones and the hormones are carried in typically the blood okay so with blood vessels you're able to carry them now at longer distances now we are not talking about micrometers or nanometers we're long, talking about longer distances. In the case of pheromones, the pheromones are carried. Can you, can you give an example of pheromone signaling? Pheromone. What? I don't know what pheromone is. Uh, the pheromone is uh, typically uh, similar to hormones, but released outside the body. Like the dogs peeing around. Actually, they're signaling to each other, showing their regions. Or the other, from the organisms to the others. All these are examples of such communication systems. These are relatively longer distances. So up to meters, for example. So long-range communication can occur via neurons and endocrine signaling and also pheromone signaling. The neurons are relatively longer to other cells and uh, specialized communication cells. Uh, main, main reason uh, of their being is mostly communication. And they connect with other neurons at what we call the synapses. The dendrites uh, of a neuron comes together uh, with the axon of another neuron at what we call the synapse or the neuron junctions, or neuromuscular junctions where a neuron comes together with a muscle cell. The signals inside the neurons are carried with electrical signals, or what we call action potentials. And they travel the length of the axon, uh, or uh, long the axon is actually 
a long portion of the neuron, part of still that neuron cell, but it's a very long extension of the neuron. When this electrical signal reaches the end of this axon, where the axon is not touching but very close to the dendrite of another neuron, that is the synaptic region. In that synaptic region, a chemical neurotransmitter is released. That means these two cells, neurons, are so close to each other at that point, but the way to transmit information from this neuron to the other would be through the release of, again, some chemical substances. Okay? There, again, you have, for example, uh, diffusion. Okay? Those are chemical neurotransmitter uh, substances. The neurotransmitters typically carry the signal. Now, I've translated from electrical signal to a chemical signal across the synaptic region to the membrane of the other neuron, uh, to the dendrite. Uh, and it arrives at the receptors on that side uh, in what we call the postsynaptic portion of the target. And the action potential can travel at speeds of up to 100 meters per second. The neurotransmitter then communicates approximately 100 nanometers uh, across the synapse in less than a millisecond. This is pretty fast, as uh, what we have discussed before. The endocrine signaling now is an, uh, is an alternative. Uh, now relies on the release of the signaling molecules, which are known as the hormones, into the bloodstream. And the blood flows in one direction. So from the up upstream molecules, you're able to carry these messenger molecules, these hormones, to downstream molecules. And this is typically, as you know, a cyclic motion. Uh, so they may travel distances this time longer than the size of the cell, tens of uh, centimeters or even longer. So while the neurotransmitter concentration is relatively high because it's well contained inside the cell, the, in the case of the endocrine signaling, the molecule concentration is generally very low because it's diluted in the blood. However, the neurotransmitter has relatively lower affinity for its target, uh, which allows it to dissociate rapidly. Uh, in the case of uh, endocrine signaling, it's not that way. So it's necessary to, uh, in order for the synapse to rapidly reset for the next signal. We want it to dissociate rapidly because if it didn't, the receiving uh, neuron would receive the first symbol, but not be prepared for the reception of another signal for a long time. So it is better if you have lower affinity so that it gets out of that symbol, gets rid of that symbol, so that it can receive another symbol. So this is actually something good for us. Thus, we can see some of the physical trade-offs that evolved in biological communication systems. As a third long-range transmission approach, we have the pheromones, as you mentioned. The pheromone is now defined as a chemical signal that triggers natural response in other organisms. So it's not between the cells, but this is between the organisms completely. Examples of natural responses uh, that may be triggered are alarm pheromones, like to get the cats out of uh, your way, out of your garden. You can just spray uh, some chemical substances, let me politely say, from the uh, animals that are natural enemies of cats, so that when the cats get the smell of these others, they keep away. 
from your garden. And these guys are selling this on the internet. <laughs> Food trail uh, pheromones is in the case of, for example, ants and other bugs. So they release pheromones uh, in places where, uh, in, uh, when, uh, on the tracks that lead to food. So that their fellow ants follow the same route to the food again. Because they're living as a colony. Uh, sex pheromones, to, for example, uh, attract uh, the other animals of the other sex and many others that affect the behavior and physiology of organisms within this species. These responses by the receiver organism may give advantage to the receiver, that would be for attracting, for example, in the case of sex hormones, or benefit to the sender, uh, in the case of, for example, uh, uh, for what can I say for the sender? Can you give an example for that? I couldn't think of an example immediately. Something that would benefit the sender. Maybe the flowers sending some things to the bees, and the bees help them reproduce. That would be both ways. The example I first gave was, sorry, that was for the sender. Only yeah. advantage to the sender, but not to the receiver. Uh, yes, but there are also cases where they both benefit, of course. Like in the case of bees, they both benefit. Both the plant benefits and also the bee benefits. So the ones that uh, give advantage to the chiromons are typical, uh, to the receiver are called chiromons, and those that give benefit to the sender are called allomons. So, uh, the, for example, the production of allomons is a form of defense. Okay? So you keep the enemies away, like the plants are typically doing this, to keep some bugs away. Uh, it is interesting to note that also some insects may develop counter mechanisms to cope against this, so they will defend against the plant allowance, for example. The chemicals, they try to keep them away. So one example is to develop a positive reaction to them, so the allowance now becomes a chiromone. Okay, Something that was meant to keep you away actually shows you where the thing is. Okay, That's also possible. Pheromone signals are also called semiochemicals, uh, and they're produced in very minute amounts. That means very few amounts. Uh, the term semiochemical is it's also written here. It comes from the word semion in Greek, uh, which is a generic term for chemical substance that carries a message. These semi, uh, semiochemicals are typically diluted in the environment, that's why they're in very minute amounts, with a complex mixture of other chemical compounds in the environment. So you have very few of such molecules in the environment. However, for example, the olfactory, the smelling systems in the insects, for example, have developed a remarkably selective and successful Sense, uh, sensing mechanisms, sensing systems that reach almost a theoretical limit for a detector. That means if they can uh, receive one or few of such molecules, they are able to detect the existence of such an object in the environment, of such an organism in the environment. They are so sensitive. It's not like the concentration should exceed the threshold. One or few molecules would be sufficient. So clearly, a pheromone is a molecular scale chemical signal. It's not at the macro scale saying the overall concentration should be so high. Existence of one or few molecules is sufficient. That's why it's at the molecule scale. And also, it carries some information, the existence or non-existence of 
for example, another organism. So let's just uh, see this video for a short time, which explains actually how a signal is formed and transmitted uh, through uh, the uh, axon of a neuron. Okay? Uh, it will be talking about what's called the uh, action potential, uh, which is actually how that signal is transmitted. energy in the form of ATP to move the ions against their diffusion gradient. And this gives us a resting potential in the neuron, which is about minus 70 millivolts, and it's said to be polarized. Now we're going to look at what causes the pattern of changes in membrane potential when the neuron fires. Looking at the soma of the neuron, we can see the dendrites. This is the site of synapses with neighboring neurons. The impulses received are processed, and small amounts of depolarization spread to the axon hillock. If this small amount of depolarization reaches a threshold, it causes voltage-dependent sodium channels in the axon membrane to open. Sodium ions diffuse along their concentration gradient into the cell, causing the inside of the neuron to become positive compared to the outside. This stage is represented in the uphill part of the action potential trace. The depolarization from the soma reaches threshold and opens the sodium channels, and this allows a rapid influx of sodium ions. This stage of the action potential is called depolarization. Looking back at our neuron, the sodium channels now close, and potassium channels will allow potassium ions to diffuse out of the cell. This swaps the polarity of the membrane again, so the inside is now more negative than the outside. And we can see on the graph that depolarization generally reaches around plus 40 millivolts before these potassium channels open. As potassium ions diffuse out, this causes repolarization of the membrane as the inside becomes more negative again. Potassium channels open and close very slowly, meaning that too much potassium diffuses out, resulting in hyperpolarization. This is then corrected because so sodium and potassium leak through the membrane. This is by diffusion with their concentration gradient. The sodium-potassium pump also helps. This brings the membrane potential back up to the resting potential. And you can see this in the graph too. In the final part, the potassium channels close and the hyperpolarization is corrected. This restores the resting potential. The time when the membrane is hyperpolarized is called the refractory period, and during this time, no action potential can occur. And this also means that the action potential always travels in only one direction. Remember, we have been looking at only a small section of the axon. The nerve impulse is propagated because these events occur repeatedly next to one another. The depolarization during the early phase of the action potential travels along the next part of the axon. This opens voltage-dependent sodium channels, and the process repeats. This is how the impulse is passed along the length of the axon. Remember also that in a myelinated neuron, like the one pictured here, action potentials only occur in the nodes of Ranvier. These are areas where there is no myelin insulating the nerve, and it produces faster conduction as the impulse can jump from one node to the next. The action potential is really simple. All you need to understand is diffusion. So, uh, the sound might have been a little bit low. I'm not sure if you all heard it. Just to make things a little bit uh, clear once again, uh, let me go over some parts uh, very fast. What you need to understand is, now first of all, uh, this is the axon, okay? So these uh, two sides are the membrane of the axon. So this is inside the axon, and these two parts are outside the axon. Typically, outside the axon, it is uh, positive, uh, and inside it's negative. So th th that's why we're talking about polarity, okay? These 
sodium uh, gates will be initially closed. That's called the resting state. So in the resting state, uh, the axon has negative polarity compared to outside, and these gates are closed. But uh, due to the trigger, these uh, gates will open, okay, which will allow the uh, passage of the sodium ions, these uh, green uh, circles, passing through these uh, sodium gates into the uh, axon where it is negative. Okay? When these gates open, these sodium ions will diffuse according to the uh, gradient. So you will have more sodium ions here. Remember, sodium ions are positive. Therefore, the uh, polarity will now change and it will be positive inside and now more negative relatively outside. Okay? And that explains actually uh, the, let me show the graph here. This part of the graph. At the red state, it's, uh, the polarity is around uh, minus 70 millivolts. And uh, bless you, when the uh, sodium ion channel opens, the sodium ions start flowing in, and that uh, turns the polarity towards positive. Okay, so that happens with the sodium ions diffusing inside the cell. Okay, so that would be called depolarization, and afterwards. As I said, now it is positive inside, okay, and negative outside, and that will cause now the potassium ions, uh, sorry, the potassium gates to open. And when the potassium gates open, remember initially you have more potassium ions inside compared to outside. So now the potassium ions, remember they're also positive signed, they flow out, okay. And as they flow out, they take uh, the graph down again. Okay, so at this point, <clears throat> sorry, at this point, the potassium channel opens, and with the flow of the uh, potassium ions outside, the uh, polarity will again turn negative. But these potassium gates remain open longer compared to sodium gates. Therefore, many potassium ions uh, will flow out. That will take it even lower compared to the original resting state. That's why this part is called hyperpolarization. This, part, uh, this side is repolarization as opposed to depolarization. But when it goes even below the rest state, that's called hyperpolarization. But after this has happened, and the potassium gates have also closed, and you're in a more negative state compared to the original rest state, you must take the neuron back to the rest state so that it goes to the original state. Okay? And that is happening due to the uh, diffusion through the cell membrane. Sodium ions and potassium ions can still go through the cell membrane so that it goes back to what's called the uh, to the it goes back to the original state to the rest uh, state uh, due to diffusion through the membrane okay and Altogether, uh, and this part is called the refractory period. During this time, a new uh, spike cannot occur. Okay, and this is happening. This has happened on this part of the axon. 
This side of the axon is closer to soma, the center of the uh, neuron. Okay? And that side, on that side, you have the synapse. So this has happened, this started from the soma, from the center of the uh, neuron, and it happened in the region that's closer to soma, and the same thing will keep on repeating throughout the axon, towards the uh, synaptic region. Okay? This way the signal is actually propagated. This repeats over and over in the axon. And this happens very fast. That's how actually this whole process is very fast in the neuron. Any questions? Does this happen uh, all along the axon or just on the ground near nose? Uh, this actually happens at the Ramier nodes and it propagates all through the axon. So at the openings uh, in the myelin sheet, it was marked here, let me, okay. At the nodes of Ramier, you have uh, the openings of the myelin sheets, so it happens typically there, but this thing propagates all through the axon till the uh, synapses at the very end. Also note that typically a neuron has multiple dendrites but a single axon, but that single axon later may branch into multiple synaptic regions. Okay? But you have a single axon going out of the Neuron. Any questions? Okay. Sorry. So, going back to the gap junction, a gap junction is one of the most direct connections that can exist between the cells. And remember, it's a narrow, aqueous channel connecting the cytoplasm of two cells. The channel is typically large enough to allow the ions, but not the larger molecules, to pass through. These uh, are either ions or the water-soluble small molecules that are passing through. But larger, more complex molecules such as proteins, nucleic acids, cannot pass through these gap junctions. And the junction itself is a nexus or a specialized intercellular connection generally found in animal cells. One gap junction is composed of two connections. Remember we had the uh, shape of connection in previous slides in, uh, last week. It's also called the hemichannels, which connect across the intercellular space. So the connections on two uh, cells should be aligned to each other so that you have the gap junction from one to the other. And the communication is generally bidirectional. It can pass from each cell to the other. And the tendency is to enable a more uniform concentration of molecules between the communicating cells. And the intracellular calcium waves and the cyclic adenosine uh, monophosphate are typical uh, signaling molecules that pass through the gap junction. Oops. Sorry. So a specific example uh, of gap junction operation uh, is uh, in the case uh, where you try to control, for example, the blood glucose levels. Okay? So typically, one of the cells could detect that the glucose level has fallen below some, let's say, threshold, but the other cells might not have detected it. This is typically in the case of pancreatic beta cells. Okay. When a pancreatic beta cell realizes that the glucose level has dropped, it knows that it should produce insulin and give insulin to the blood. However, uh, the insulin produced by a single cell would not be sufficient. So what it does is it informs all its colleagues in the environment, all those uh, that are close by, by means of gap junctions, by means of calcium signaling, that the blood glucose level has dropped. So all of them will start producing 
e, insulin hormon e, and also e, produce glucose to e, keep the glucose level higher. The molecular information within the nanoscale network is typically subject to problems that are similar to the problems encountered in traditional, uh, traditional networks. In the case of traditional networks, the problems are mostly due to noise in the environment, the electromagnetic signals that are already in the environment, the attenuation, which is a decrease in the power of the uh, signal, typically with distance, and also collision between other transmitters that are transmitting using the same medium. In traditional networks, physical techniques can be utilized to cope with these problems and provide the integrity of the signal. One such method would be, for example, shielding the wires. For example, remember, in the case of a coaxial cable, we have the shielding around the cable to prevent or decrease the interference from uh, other so uh, electromagnetic sources. Or in the case of wireless networks, what we do is we beam the signal and try to shoot at a specific region so that our signal goes only to that region. What you actually do by beaming is you prevent the interference from your signal to the nearby sources. If everybody is using this technique, you will have lower interference. Okay. So you try to send your signal to an intended region. Uh, you can do, you can apply the similar concepts, for example, in the case of uh, sending uh, molecules for communication. So for example, you can uh, put your mo uh, signaling molecules within a cover uh, so that they will not be uh, interfered with other molecules in the environment. Okay. Note that one of the problems we have here could be the uh, signaling molecules you're sending might go into chemical reaction with other molecules in the environment and they will change. And if they change, they will not be received by the receptor. Okay? So if you can, for example, uh, cover the signaling molecules in, uh, with something else, that would help you to uh, reduce uh, the interference from uh, the other uh, molecules in the environment. The structure that's used for this purpose is typically what's known as vesicles. Remember, we discussed the topic of ves uh, we discussed about the vesicles uh, when we discussed the molecular motors. We said you produce the uh, messenger molecules and put them in a vesicle, and then the molecule mes uh, the vesicle is attached to the molecular motor which carries it over the uh, microtubules, okay? So uh, we can make use of vesicles and liposomes. Actually, the vesicle itself is uh, made from uh, fatty proteins. So uh, it's like a small bubble of liquid within the cell, which carries the molecules, uh, messenger molecules inside. So it's a small uh, intracellular and membrane enclosed sac bag that contains your uh, molecules. The vesicles uh, form naturally within the cell due to the properties of lipid membranes. And many vesicles can have specialized functions depending on the materials, the molecules they carry inside. The vesicles are separated from the intracellular fluid by at least one poly, uh, sorry, phospholipid bilayer, but they can have uh, multiple of them. If there's only one phospholipid layer for the vesicle, it's called unilamel, uh, unilamellar uh, vesicle. If multiple, then it's multilamellar vesicle, which where lamellar means the membrane. So the vesicles typically store our messenger molecules uh, and they store them using uh, the vesicles, we transport them and digest cellular products or waste also 
You put the waste in the uh, vesicle and transport it. The membrane typically uh, the membrane that encloses the vesicle is similar to what you already have in the plasma membrane. This provides us something. You put your messenger molecules inside the vesicle, you transport them up to the membrane, and when it reaches the membrane, since it's the same material, the vesicle can fuse with the membrane, the universe becomes part of the membrane, and while doing that, it throws whatever is inside, outside the cell. Okay? Uh, so there are actually inside the membrane, in the inner side of the membrane, there are some ports to which the vesicle can attach, and when it uh, attaches at that port, it will explode from that part, everything inside the vesicle goes out, while the inner side of the uh, vesicle becomes part of the membrane. Uh, therefore, the vesicles are a basic tool used by the cell for organizing the cellular substances. Uh, the vesicles are involved in the metabolism, transport, and buoyancy control, and also enzyme storage. And they can also act as chemical reaction chambers. You can have the reaction in a contained environment inside the vesicle. It will not interact with the rest of the cytoplasm, for example. A system proposed in one of the references, uh, available, in, uh, available in the slides, uses the liposomes, uh, which is actually an artificially created vesicle that has lipid bilayer uh, bi membrane, just like the vesicles. The liposome is used to encapsulate the information molecules, and then it is passed through the gap junction as a whole uh, liposome. And the advantage of the liposome is the same as the vesicle in the uh, motor-based molecular communication network we already discussed in chapter 2. It can store multiple molecules, messenger molecules. It can protect those messenger molecules from other molecules uh, in the cytoplasm. Uh, it is important to, uh, that some molecules will not last long enough in the intercellular medium. So again, the motion of this molecule may be analyzed by the Brownian motion, similar for liposome. So a liposome is like a vesicle, a small vesicle, made out of the same material as a cell membrane, as before. And the liposome can be filled with drugs, for example, so that you send the drugs to some distant uh, cell, and only that cell will receive it. So what you do is you put the drug in the liposome and send it. No other cell will receive it. Typically, what they do is this is used for nanomedicine, for coping, for fighting against cancer. So the drug itself contains the poison. So you don't want it to interact with the other cells. So you put the poison in and encode it in the liposome and you address the liposome only to the cancer cells. Only those cells will accept it, and therefore they will die. As a channel in an information transport network, the liposome would contain gap junctions on its membrane, similar to a normal cell. Uh, the information molecules inside the transmitting cell typically propagate to the liposome container, through the gap junctions we just mentioned, uh, which co uh, connects the adjacent liposome to the transmitting cell. And then that liposome is transported to a receiver cell where the information molecule uh, propagate from the liposome, this time to the receiving cell, again through those gap junctions in a similar manner. And the liposome acts like, this time, a shuttle that's carrying the information molecules from the transmitter to the receiver in a contained environment. This time we're not complete, we're not releasing the molecules uh, to the environment, but we're sending it in a shuttle to the destination. But don't forget that this shuttle is subject to Brownian motion. 
So you cannot guarantee that it will go to that cell. You release it, due to Brownian motion, it may go somewhere else. So for example, you may need to duplicate this to make sure at least one of them will arrive at the destination. Sorry. Yeah. Does the liposomes if emerge in the evolution or uh, the cell decides to uh, put it on the liposome? Once, once again? Uh, I couldn't get the idea, like, uh, the cell itself decides to put the molecule into the liposome or it's just naturally, uh, it's uh, immersed in the evolution time duration? See, uh, the cell doesn't have the brain, of course. So, of course, the cell has evolved in evolution to do the communication this, uh, this way. Because you said uh, we are now sending a molecule within an uh, encapsulated system. So, uh, well, there are cells that work with liposomes, and there are cells that work without the liposomes. So, in evolution, some cells have evolved that way, some others the other way. So, both are available, but. This has, of course, come with evolution. Otherwise, such cells would not survive at all. Uh, information, uh, okay, so sorry, we didn't discuss this. Yeah. The information molecules inside the transmitting cell, oh, sorry, we did this, right? I'm, yeah, we discussed this, sorry. So, there are many types of signaling mechanisms. Uh, so, uh, molecules used for signaling, like proteins, small peptides, amino acids, nucleotides, steroids, retinoids, fatty acids, and dissolved gases like nitric acid and carbon monoxide. All these molecules may be released by different ways. Cells may release these signaling molecules that are bound within the vesicle or membranes through what's known as exocytosis. Some signals may be released by a simple diffusion, what we initially ha had discussed. The first one is what we just discussed. The second one is what we discussed in chapter two. And also some signaling molecules remain attached to the cell membrane and are only activated when another cell makes contact. So the cells may communicate also by contacting each other. It should be noted that signaling, if you look at the concentrations of these signaling molecules, the uh, molarities of these molecules are very small, like less than 10 to the minus 8 molars. And they bind with a very high affinity constant, like uh, 10 to the 8 liters per mole. The affinity constant sim is simply the ratio of the bound concentration of the molecules to the product of the unbound concentrations in equilibrium. Okay? So high affinity constant shows that the molecules are tightly bound uh, as the unbound concentration is very low if you're talking about high affinity. Also this binding between the signaling molecule and the target receptor occurs with high specificity. So signaling mechanisms can now be classified by the distance over which these methods are being used. Uh, like contact-dependent signaling requires direct membrane contact, which means at a distance of almost zero uh, nanometers. You need physical contact. Uh, some other uh, techniques, for example, could be used to signal cells that are close by, for example, with diffusion. Some require still uh, contact, as in the case of gap junctions. Uh, so there are different ways. If the signals affect the cells of a different type, so communication from uh, cell type A to type B, then it is called paracrine signals. If the signal affects the cells of the same type, then it is called autocrine signals. One important mechanism in signaling is the control of the signaling molecules. So uh, for the molecular concentration to work properly and remain local, it must be removed rapidly. So you should be able to clear it 
rapidly. There are several mechanisms in, uh, by which these, this thing occurs. So the molecules can be taken up by neighboring cells, for example, destroyed by enzymes, or caught within the extracellular matrix. Also, some proteins known as antagonists can bind to the signaling molecules and render them ineffective. Remember, the receptor is able to uh, take only one type of uh, messenger molecule. So, if an antagonist makes a new complex, a new compound with the messenger molecule, it will be different from the messenger molecule, so it cannot bind to the receptor. This way, for example, you can uh, take it away from the receptor. Or if you can, using enzymes, if you can break it, that's also an option. Then they won't uh, interact. It, it won't stick at the receptor. So in summary, cells communicate with each other via either direct contact, in the case of Jessacrine, signaling over short distances in the case of uh, signaling or over longer distances and or scales, for example, in the case of endocrine signaling. Some cell-to-cell -cell communication requires direct cell-to-cell -cell contact between the cells and some cells can form gap junctions to connect their cytoplasms to each other so that it operates like a single cytoplasm. In the case of cardiac muscle, for example, the gap junctions between the adjacent cells allows for action potential propagation from the cardiac pacemaker region of the heart to spread and also cause coordinated contraction of the heart. Because when the signal is received, all of them should immediately contract so that uh, the heart can pump the blood out, for example. Okay, and then they should all be released simultaneously. So it requires very good synchronization. So this is where we will stop for today. And next week we will continue from this point. If you have any questions, okay. And I'll see you all next week. Let's work with